Hi, everybody. I'm James Cahote. I am a final year PhD student at the Oxford Center for Nonlinear PDs. Um, and I'm here to talk to you today about um, non uniqueness of limits of geometric flows. Um, before I start, I just want to say a quick thanks to the organizers of the Junior Mathematician Research Archive. Uh, I think it's a really nice idea, and I'm really pleased to be able to present my research. Um, so without further ado, let me get to what we're going to be talking about today. Um, so I'm going to be talking about some, some results which are joint with uh, Melanie Rutland and Peter Topping. Um, so these are about geometric flows, and in particular, it's about a geometric flow that finds minimal surfaces. So first I'll tell you a bit about um, what minimal surfaces are, and then I'd like to talk quickly about um, what exactly I mean by this non-uniqueness of limits here that I have in the title. Um, and finally, we'll get to the, to, the, to the results that we proved. So let's get started. So what are minimal surfaces? So we need a closed manifold N, which we might as well assume to be embedded into Euclidean space. Um, and minimal surfaces are critical points of the area functional of submanifold in N. Um, so this picture that I've drawn here is the case of geodesics, and that's the one-dimensional analog. So hopefully you've um, seen or heard something about geodesics, which are um, critical points of the length functional of curves. Um, and so essentially what we do is we consider the problem one dimension up, or maybe you might consider these things in, in more generality. Um, so what I do is geometric flows, and I'm, concern, I'm concerned with doing something which is finding an explicit deformation to a minimal surface. So there are many ways in which you can do this, but what I'm going to be doing is talking today about the Teichmuller harmonic map flow. Uh, and that's a gradient flow designed to find closed minimal surfaces in a target manifold. So this flow was introduced by Ruplin and Topping in 2012. So there might be other ways that you could conceive of to um, find minimal surfaces using flow methods, um, but this is what we're going to be considering today. Um, I should say a quick thing about the applications of this. So they're pretty important. Well, studying, finding minimal surfaces is a very important problem in geometry but it also has applications to topology, um, to mathematical physics, and so on. So it's, it's quite an important um, field of study. Um, so that was just a brief um, aside to tell you what minimal surfaces are. And now I want to tell you um, what gradient flows are and what's the problem that we're going to be considering in more generality later. Um, so, I'd really like to stick to Rn for simplicity. Um, a lot of these things do hold in more generality, but it's just a bit easier to state um, what I mean. Um, so let's take a smooth function, f, which maps Rn into R, and then we consider um, this uh, system of ODEs here. Um, this is the negative gradient flow of f. And one reason you might consider um, such a system of ODEs is uh, the result that are written here. Uh, so this says that if you have a solution, that exists for all time and remains in a fixed compact subset, then it will converge along a subsequence of times to a critical point of that. So um, in our context, we might be thinking of some functional, which we can then look at the gradient flow of to give us minimal surfaces, which would be critical points of the area. Um, and now um, in this context, we have a pretty natural question, which says, um, does this trajectory x of t converge along every sequence of times now to the same limit? So a question like this might arise, for example, if you wanted to um, extract the limit from a one-parameter family of, um, say, initial data. Um, and so, as stated, this is actually quite false. Um, so I won't write down the example here, but I claim that you can find a smooth function f for which there are trajectories that look like this. So they spiral outwards around and around until they meet a um, circle of critical points, which they kind of asymptote. So if you like in two different colors, I've um, labeled two sequences of time showing that this is um, not true, or that this doesn't hold for this function f. Um, so really what I should have said perhaps is, can we find a sufficient condition on f that um, tells us that we have this property of uniqueness of asymptote? limits. So one way that we can do something like this is um, 
a result due to Voyasevich, who said that if f is a real analytic function, then the gradient flow will have this property of unique asymptotic limits. So what he did was he established um, the following inequality, which I've stated here. So if you look at the, uh, if you look at a real analytic function, you find on some open subset of Rn, and you take a uh, point x bar in that open subset, which we um, will think of as a critical point, then what you can do is you can find a neighborhood given by this sigma, and you can find a number alpha, which essentially will tell you the behavior of the function f in this neighborhood, such that you have this inequality that I've labeled um, slash L. Um, so essentially what happens is if you know that your function is real analytic, you can establish this inequality. Um, and using this inequality, it's actually quite easy to show convergence. Um, but of course, this is just a necessary condition. So you don't, um, you can still have this property of uniqueness of asymptotic limits, even if you're not um, real analytic. Uh, and really quickly, I'll just say that this value of alpha is uh, actually related to the rate of convergence. So when alpha equals half, you have the best possible case, which is um, exponential convergence. Um, okay. And now, very quickly, for, for those of you who are familiar with these things, I should mention um, the results due to Simon, um, who extended these things to cases um, which are relevant for the calculus of variations and for um, PDEs. Um, so, for example, he considered functionals of this form, so the integral of some convex and analytic integrand. I won't say exactly in which sense I mean these, but you can make sense of this. Um, so, in this context of these functionals, you have the L2 gradient, which, if you know what it means, is just the Euler-Lagrange operator, or some second-order um, differential operator. Um, and then, when you make the correct definitions, you actually have the same inequality. So now you need u to be in a C2 beta neighborhood of your critical point. So this is the C2 beta is the um, is a holder space. So in, in particular, we need more than kind of two derivatives to be controlled for this. For this point. So we'll we'll see later on that this um, will actually be quite important for the for applications for the flow. So we have the same inequality, and it turns out that this same inequality in certain circumstances will allow you to get the. Uh, uh, result saying that you have uh, convergence, and you have uniqueness of asymptotic limits. Um, so oftentimes when people prove inequalities of this type, which we call Voyasevich-Simon inequalities, the proof really goes in, in the same way that Simon did. So I'll quickly mention how the proof, um, what happens with the proof. Um, so this convexity will give you some ellipticity. Um, and then you can use something called the Lyapunov-Schmidt procedure, which allows you to reduce the problem to kind of finitely many bad directions. So in these bad directions um, will correspond to the kernel of the Hessian. Um, and then in these directions, you can apply the Voyasevich inequality that I stated before, which holds in finite dimensions. Um, so that was just a whirlwind tour of, of kind of what happens with the Voyasevich Simon inequalities. And I'll say now, what we're going to be doing later on is considering the case for the flow that I'm about to introduce to you now. So I'll get on to um, this type more harmonic map flow and talk a bit about flowing to minimal surfaces. So for us, minimal surfaces are always going to be parameterized over a fixed, closed, oriented surface M. So this is a two-dimensional surface, um, and hopefully you know that uh, these things will be determined by their genus. So you have um, spheres, you have tori, and then you have kind of tori with uh, more holes and as many holes as you like. Um, so before we had this picture of geodesics, now obviously things are in, in uh, higher dimensions. So say we're considering maps from the sphere into our high dimensional target, um, and as I have as I've drawn here. Uh, and so ver for various reasons, one might not actually want to consider the area functional. Um, and we are not in this case, we're going to be considering um, essentially an analog of the Dirichlet energy. Uh, so what we need to do is we need to fix a metric G on M so that we can do things like um, measure lengths and take derivatives, um, well, measure lengths of derivatives. Um, and then essentially once we've done that, we can look at uh, this quantity here um, and call it the Dirichlet energy. So this is essentially uh, the grad U squared just measured with respect to metric G. Um, and so we're always going to be considering this for maps mapping M into N and metrics G on M. 
And now we're going to allow both of these things to move. So I want to tell you exactly why it is you might do this, given I'm talking about critical points of the area. Um, so first of all, I'll say critical points of um, E of UG, when we fix the metric G here, are called harmonic maps. So these are the things that are well studied. Um, but maybe you know that in some cases, they might be critical points of the area, but quite often they actually aren't. So we need to do something else in this case. Um, and what we're going to do is use the following observation. So if we have a critical point G, um, where now we fix the map U, then U mapping MG into N is a conformal map. So that means it preserves um, angles. And then, um, believe me, we have a following fact, which says that the image of a conformal harmonic map defines a minimal surface, at least away from the points where its derivative vanishes. Right, so that motivates us to say, well, okay, we have this functional E, critical points are in some sense minimal surfaces, so let's consider a gradient flow of this functional, now where we move both the map and metric, um, and hope that we're going to flow to minimal surfaces. And this is exactly the idea that um, is behind the type Miller harmonic map flow. So here, just so you know, um, if you know what these objects mean, I've written down what the L2 gradient of this energy is. So if we vary the map, we get something called the tension field, which is um, common um, in the study of harmonic maps. So this is essentially um, kind of an adapted Laplacian for N. Um, and we have that the L2 gradient in the metric direction is given by the Hopkins. So I won't actually use what these things are in this talk, um, but if you know what they are, you'll know a bit more about what the flow actually looks like. So without further ado, I can actually tell you what the Teichmuller harmonic map flow is. Um, so for the map, we consider the negative L2 gradient flow, which is actually the harmonic map flow of Eels and Samson, if you know what that is. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna couple this equation with an evolution for the metric. And um, like I said, we're going to want to take the L2, the negative L2 gradient flow, um, but now we need to do something else, and we actually need to project onto the space orthogonal to the symmetries. Um, so this is essentially so that we get a well-behaved flow. If we just um, allowed the whole group of symmetries to be in play, then it, things wouldn't work out as nicely. Um, so this is a flow that was introduced by um, Ruplin and Topping in 2012. Um, at least in this form. So originally it was studied um, by Ding, Li, and Liu in 2006 um, for the case where the domain was just a porous. Um, and actually, I should also say that um, an important case is when the domain is the sphere, um, this just reduces to the harmonic map flow. So the metric actually does not evolve in that case. Um, and so we, that's kind of a well-studied case of um, the harmonic map flow in two dimensions. Um, Okay. So um, I should tell you in, in what sense this flow actually finds minimal surfaces. So um, this is quite a, quite a big result, but we're not going to use it in, in its full strength, so I'll just um, state it quite quickly. So if I give you smooth initial data, um, then there is a global weak solution to the flow, which will, in some sense, converge to a minimal surface. So by global weak solution, I mean a solution that will exist for all times, but there might be some kind of singular behavior of the, of the map and metric. So in particular, if you're familiar with the, with the harmonic map flow, um, we can have the presence of bubbling, with, which comes when there's energy concentration of the map. But now from the metric component, we can also have um, degeneration. So we can essentially have um, long thin necks forming in this, in this domain. Um, and so what they do is, um, if you have a situation where the domain generates like this, you might not end up with a um, minimal surface parameterized over your original domain, but in this case that I've drawn here, you might be able to um, find the limit as a map from, say, um, two things that are a type of a torus, right? So you'd have a map from one torus here and a map from one torus here, for example. So I won't be talking much about, um, actually, the singular behavior, so I just want to state a more concrete result um, in the absence of any singularities. Um, so what I write here is actually a bit simpler than what they prove in paper that, I, that this comes from. I mean, in particular, they can deal with um, bubbling. Um, 
but so I'll state this this result because this is what we're going to um, be building off of in a second. So if we have a smooth solution over flow, um, which has no singularities in infinite time, um, and essentially what I mean by this is um, there can be any bubbling, so that's what is ruled out by this second condition here, and also there can't be any of this domain degeneration, which is what's ruled out um, by this first condition. So in this case, um, once you pass to a subsequence of times and you find a suitable sequence of diffeomorphisms of your domain, you have that um, this, this solution will converge to a conformal harmonic map. That, that is, it'll converge to a critical point of the energy. So it finds a minimal surface in some sense. So um, you should think of this in the context of the finite dimensional result that I said, which is that gradient flows will find critical points. And in that same regard, we have similar questions of uh, uniqueness of asymptotic limits. So um, do I have convergence to the same limit if I don't, if I, if I take a different subsequence? Um, so we're, we want to know about that. We have another question now, which is we have these diffeomorphisms fi. So the question is, do we need them? So they, they, they come out, but maybe we haven't done a good job in improving this result, or the, the people who um, did prove this result didn't do a good job. Um, so actually, it turns out they, they did do a good job, and we were able to show that, um, that they were necessary and that we don't have this uniqueness of asymptotic limits property. Um, so I mentioned before that there's this finite dimensional example, um, and actually there's also um, work for the harmonic map flow, um, which shows that you don't have uniqueness of asymptotic limits. But um, what we do is we, um, firstly, we construct um, an explicit example in this case, which shows that you don't have this uniqueness of asymptotic limits. So one which isn't actually the harmonic map flow, so where you have the metric evolving. Um, and we also, using a very similar construct, well, using a quite similar construction, um, we're able to show that these diffeomorphisms really are um, necessary. So that's just what I've stated here. So we can find, we um, construct a smooth closed target manifold. That's our, um, that's the thing I called N. Um, and we also wrote down a solution of the flow into this target, which has no singularities in the way that um, I described in the previous theorem. Um, and will not converge unless we pull back by these different morphisms. So essentially what's happening is we're able to force the domain metric um, to, um, well, when we, when we deal with different morphisms, we're able to force the domain metric to twist um, as we go to, as the time goes to infinity. Um, and that essentially makes, uh, means that the different morphisms that we have to pull back by have to get wilder and wilder. So I won't say much more about this result, but um, if you want, you can go and look at the construction in, in the paper. Um, now I want to talk a bit about uh, maybe some positive results. So um, before, when I was talking about finite dimensional things, um, I said that when there's real analyticity, you had these results of Voyasevich simon which you could use to get um, kind of um, convergence to a unique asymptotic limit. So the question is, can we do that in this case? So can we obtain a Voyasevich Simon inequality? And also, can we use that to then obtain convergence? So it turns out we can. Um, so what we need to do is um, ensure that the target manifold is real analytic. Um, and then in that context, we have essentially exactly the Voyasevich Simon inequality that um, we would expect based on the results of Simon. Um, so it, the main difference here is um, maybe a technical one, which is now we're using, um, we're measuring distance in the Sobolev space HS for S greater than three. So we should think of this as being quite similar um, in some sense to being, uh, it, it's kind of a replacement for the holder space. We, we do this for a bit of a, a technical reason. But otherwise we have es essentially the same inequality where now um, on the right-hand side, we have the correct notion of L2 gradient in our, in our context. Um, and uh, essentially, yeah, so I, I mentioned a bit about the Lyapunov-Schmidt um, procedure that is used to prove these inequalities. Um, and so we do go along the same lines. Um, we need to work a bit um, due to the presence of the metric. For that, we use something called a slice theorem. Um, so if you haven't heard of that, um, don't worry, and you can go and read about the proof. Um, but you should take away that essentially the proof is along the same lines as Simon, and that, that's kind of how these things usually go in, in these contexts. 
Okay, and now I promised um, an improved convergence result as well, or I've questioned whether such a thing exists, and we were able to do this. Um, so again, um, we're in the context where we have a flow that's converging. Um, so we have a sequence of times ti going to infinity, and we want to say that we're converging to a um, stationary point. So we can always, so if the solution is it's nice enough, we're always going to be able to find this um, sequence of times. But again, what we have to do is we need to say that we have no um, singular behavior. So we can't have any of this um, energy concentration, which leads to bubbling. And we also can't have any of this um, domain degeneration. So in the absence of any of that, we're actually able to use our voice say, of Simon inequality to prove smooth convert, well, to prove convergence to a unique um, critical point as t goes to infinity. And I should emphasize here that this convergence, again, is without pulling back by any difference diffeomorphisms. Um, so I think that's, that's quite nice, except we do have these, um, the, these two assumptions here which say that we can't deal with any singular behavior. And the last thing I want to do is just quickly um, comment on these two. So like I mentioned, the first condition here um, says that there can't be any energy concentration. So this rules out um, any bubbling. And so it, it's quite an important problem to understand whether you can obtain these types of results um, in the presence of bubbling, and it turns out that it's actually quite a hard problem. So up until very recently, there weren't many results um, that were very general. All, all of the results really held in quite specific situations, say for maps from the two-sphere to the two-sphere for the harmonic map flow. Um, um, and maybe there's been a bit more um, recent work on this, but it, it, it's quite a hard problem. Um, on the other hand, um, we also have this um, new case for the flow, which is this domain degeneration, and we can think of um, what might happen in, in this context when kind of um, our limit will be maybe parameterized over a surface with a uh, different topology to our, um, pro our approximating sequence in a sense. So this latter case is actually um, the subject of some, some recent work, some work that I've been working on recently um, to try and obtain a suitable voyeur simon inequality in the case where we do have this um, degeneration. Um, but I think that that's it. So those are the main results that I wanted to talk to you about. I'd like to say thank you for um, listening. And if you would like to learn more, um, I've just given a very brief introduction to these things. Um, you can check out the paper. And if you do have any questions or want to know more about the background, feel free to send me an email um, here. Okay, so thanks very much.